like Cassidy's making progress by stretching her rubber band <laughs> and using her square I'm thinking brackets to complete her exercises on chord symbols. Listen as Cassidy identifies the root quality chord symbols and discovers how intervals determine the functional chord symbol numbers. Now this is just a great exercise and I always have my students doing this on the whiteboard so they can easily see the intervals. Here's Cassidy. Okay, Cassidy, we're on page 41, and we're now going to do our chords. So I noticed that you've already gone ahead and done them on the whiteboard. So we're going to do the root quality chord symbol and then the functional chord symbol. We're gonna do the root quality chord symbol above the chord and the functional chord symbol below. You ready? Yep. Yes, ma'am, she says. Okay, let's do this. So the very first one, we're doing D major triad. The root uh, of D major tonic triad would be what? D. D. So go ahead and put the letter D up there. Okay, now is that in root position? This is in second inversion. Okay, so now we want to go ahead and put in a slash. And what note's at the bottom? A is at the bottom. A. Okay, so then we're going to add your A. All right, excellent. Now we'll put in the functional chord symbol. So this is the tonic, so what number will that be? One. One. Okay, go ahead and do that. Now, in order to determine the functional chord symbol, what is the interval from the top note to the root? That would be six. Six. Okay, so we're going to put six. And then from the uh, second note there, yeah, go ahead and put your lines down. Perfect. And then the next interval to the root would be? Uh, four. Four. So that's called a six-four. Excellent. Okay, let's do the next one. So now we have uh, the subdominant. What number is that? Four. Four. Subdominant of E flat major. So who is the root? A flat. Okay, so we'll do our, our um, functional chord symbol for root quality chord symbol first, A flat. Okay, and then is A flat the root of that triad? No, C is. C, okay, so we're going to go ahead and do the slash C. Okay, now we're writing the subdominant. What number is that? Four. Four, and it's major, so uppercase or lower? Uppercase. Okay, so uppercase four. Okay, and then go ahead and finish your functional chord symbol. Top note to the root or to the bottom would be? Um, that would be six. Yeah, so go ahead and draw that in. Six, and then the bottom to the interval is an interval of a third. Third. Okay, so that's your four, six, three. Excellent. Okay, next one. Now we're doing the dominant triad of F minor in second inversion. Okay, dominant is number? Five. Five. Okay, so now what is the root note of that triad in root position? C. C, so we're going to go ahead and put your C on top. Now, is C the root of your chord? No, G. G is the bottom. Okay, C is the root, but it's not in root position. No. So you're right. Okay, so go ahead and do your slash. And so what note is at the bottom? It's G. G. Perfect. Okay, so now this was the dominant. So what uh, Roman numeral will we use? Five. Five. Okay, so go ahead and put that in. And now we just need to finish off that functional chord symbol. So go ahead and figure out what your intervals are. Top to bottom is a? Six. Six. And then the bottom two would be? Four. Four. Excellent. Now the last one is going to be a little bit tricky. So now they're asking you to write the subdominant triad of B minor in first inversion. Subdominant is what number? Four. Four. Okay, so now we're going to look at our triad. Who is the root? Um, that would be E. E. So go ahead and put your E on top. Now we have E, G, B. Is that major or minor? That is a minor. Chord. Minor. Okay, so we need a little baby M there, lowercase m. And then slash. Now who is at the bottom? G. G. Okay, so go ahead and finish. So our root quality chord symbol is E, and then lowercase m for minor, and G is at the bottom. Okay, and now we're going to put in our um, functional chord symbol. So subdominant is what number? Four. Four. So we're going to use upper or lowercase? Lowercase okay. because it's minor. Because it's minor. Perfect. Okay, and then go ahead and finish your numbers there. And so these are so easy because all we have to do is just read the intervals, right? Six and then three. Three. Great. So was that easy or was that easy? Easy. Easy. <laughs> Good. In level five, 
on page 54, you are completing a two-measure phrase ending on stable scale degree one. A melody may consist of a two-measure phrase followed by a question phrase followed by a two-measure answer phrase. So you're learning to end the melody moving in stepwise motion from the supertonic down to the tonic and from the leading tone up to the tonic. So that is the exercise. We want to end on the tonic, but we can approach it in stepwise motion, uh, stepping down to the tonic or stepping up to the tonic. Now in the answer book on page 54, uh, you will see completed examples. One possible answer for each question using the given rhythm and then ending on the tonic as indicated. So again, um, the, uh, the first one up there is just blank, so that would be what the question looks like, and then the one below it is the answer book, right? So you can see that they've stepped down to the tonic and that they stepped up to the tonic. And it's good to, you know, start with those little rules, but for sure we want to have fun because composing is about creativity, right? Four measure phrase. So what's new in level five is the parallel period. Now a parallel period usually uh, eight measures and contains two four measure phrases. So the first four measure phrase is called the antecedent that asks the question and may end on an unstable scale degree such as such as two or seven and sounds unfinished or, or open questioning. The second four measure phrase is called the consequent and that concludes the answer and it may end on a stable scale degree one or three. I usually encourage my students to end on one uh, even though three is also acceptable but just when they're starting out it sounds a little more final for them. Now in the answer book on page 55 you will see the antecedent ends on an unstable scale degree two and when composing the four measure consequent or answer phrase, be sure to copy the first two measures from the question phrase into the first two measures of the answer phrase. And then complete the answer phrase ending on the tonic. So that is scale degree number one. And you'll see that I've written one possible answer, which is written on these pages, as they are provided for you as, as sample answers, right? So you and your students will come up with your own ideas, but at least um, you have something that you, can, that you can look at, right? Where do we start when we're doing composing if you haven't done it before? And a lot of students will ask you this question. This is a big one. You ready? Am I a composer? <laughs> now, your students may have asked you that. You can leave me a little note. How many of you have had your students say, am I a composer? <gasps> that question mark on their face when they're first ready to start composing. Well, get out your rubber band and stretch your mind, stretch your comfort zone. And remember, stretching always requires change. When starting composing, um, Danica kind of has, or uh, Danica, Cassidy has that, uh, I'm not sure look on her face, right? <laughs> but that's okay. To be honest, Cassidy really stretched her rubber band and stepped outside her comfort zone in doing these videos with me. Now, listen as she creates her question and answer parallel period. All right, Miss Cassidy, we're starting with our parallel period composing today. We're on page 55 and Sola and Tito look a little concerned. <laughs> Antecedent asks a question, consequent concludes. That's like a big mouthful. How do you feel about composing? It's scary. <laughs> it's really scary, right? It is and it's okay to be scared. So I just want you to play the very first, the concept. Can you just say that little line up there? Antecedent asks a question, consequent concludes. Oh, you did good with that. That's like a tongue twister. So I'm just going to get you to play the antecedent. What is the antecedent? It's the... The first phrase that asks a question. Exactly right, the first phrase. So go ahead and play that just in the question. And I see you've got Tito sitting there. You've already written it out on your whiteboard. So go ahead and play that, Cassidy.
Okay, now in order just to kind of help you out the first time, I don't want you to be too scared. <laughs> I'm actually gonna let you look inside the answer book. So go ahead and grab the answer book. Now, the answer book, um, and this is not cheating, this is called studying. So I want you to play what's written in the answer book so you kind of have a clue like, well, how do I get started? What should I do? So go ahead and play the answer as you see it written in the first one there. Very good. So what you notice is that a question ends with kind of a question mark and openness, right? So it's usually ending on an unstable scale degree. And a stable scale degree would be degree number? One. One. Okay, so now I'm going to have you close the answer book. <laughs> No more cheating there. Oh, that was studying. That's not cheating. That's studying. Okay, so now go ahead and you create your own. Now, the reason that we've got the whiteboard up here is because it's good to try a few different things before writing the answer in your actual book. So I always like to use the whiteboard first so you can kind of have a few ideas and write them down and then pick the one you like best. So go ahead and, and uh, let's hear your first example. Remember that the first two measures will be identical and then you're going to use that uh, dotted quarter note, eighth note, quarter note, and then dotted half note. That's the rhythmic pattern we're going to use for the consequent or the answer phrase. Okay. And you're going to end on what note? The tonic. Which is what? C. C, because we're in the key of C, correct? Yes. All right, so Lentito are here to support you. So here is Cassidy in her first composition okay. in a parallel period. Now do another one, but this time it has to be different. Okay. Because, you know, you and it's a good thing that we're recording this because my daughter Sherry, who you know is a composer and musician, and she always says record everything and then you can write it down. You just have to, you know, figure out what you played and <laughs> go ahead and put it on your whiteboard. So let's do one more. Okay. Let's see what you come up with this time. Very good, was that different? Yes. Okay, good job, thanks Cassidy. Now you can write it out on your whiteboard and then we'll put it in your workbook.